I'm glad to be here with my two colleagues, and we're going to talk about the uh, Department of Energy NNSA project entitled Pipeline Development of Skilled Workforce Through Advanced Manufacturing Engineering. We uh, have about eight universities and the three national labs, and we get together and uh, wrote a proposal to develop uh, workforce in the advanced manufacturing, mostly just 3D printing. And now, for eight university and three national laboratory or plants, that's not an easy job to get together and you've been working on the project, you know. Uh, even you have a project by one university, sometimes you have uh, problems or difficulty in uh, management and coordination or collaboration. But the DOE and especially NSA, they want us to work together so we can take the advantage of the uh, different university, mostly HBCUs, and also national laboratories. So encourage them to work together and to do the research, training, and outreach. So originally, to start with, uh, originally they have uh, eight consortiums under Department of Energy and NSA. And then they want to s combine that into four. So one of them is our consortium is the advanced manufacturing. So consortium for advanced uh, manufacturing. So the <clears throat> because advanced manufacturing, especially 3D printing, is a new technology area. And Department of Energy, especially NNSA, they have to manufacture the nuclear parts for weapons and other type of uh, uh, devices. And we lack of the workforce in this area. So that's why they have this idea and they work with the National Laboratory and our university try to say, okay, if we uh, have the the project have the funding. Can you all work together? Because the HBCUs, we are good in training the minority students, and but we also need the national laboratory because they know what type of skills force they need in the future. If you look at the statistics, a lot of those workforce going to retire either soon or in the next five to 10 years, especially the federal laboratories and uh, uh, plants. And so they are in urgent need for this new skill workforce and so that we can help to train and educate. And the goal of the consortium is the first, you build the, and maintain skill stand pipeline because we need to build a uh, skilled uh, force and we need the pipeline. We need to the uh, K through 12 and the college student to come out and uh, so we can train them and they can work for the country and for the federal government and especially Department of Energy and NSA. And we also, one of the objectives is to, to foster advanced research because this is a relative new area. There are a lot of difficulties and to transfer from the traditional manufacturing process to the advanced manufacturing process, especially 3D printing process. And the next goal, of course, ed enhance education and training. And the last one is to expand the STEM outreach. So we not only worry the training of our uh, student and which you know, our university are to do that. We do training of undergraduate student, we do research, 
and in graduate program and also train the graduate student. But we also have to expand to uh, get the high school student, elementary school student involved so that they can, when they graduate, they want to come to our area. Now the university we have, we have Alabama, Alabama A&M University, Clark Atlanta, Hampton, uh, Howard, Lincoln University, North Carolina A&T, and Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Southern University of New Orleans, University of District Columbia. Then we have three national laboratory and plants, and that is a uh, Kansas City plant and uh, they call it uh, National Security Campus now, but it's a Kansas City plant. And we have Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Then we have White 12 plant, and they call now White 12 National Security Complex. So we have eight HBCUs and three national laboratories. And I'm Shoyu Chan. I'm from North Carolina A&T State University. I'm the project director. And here with me, Dr. Hamush. He is uh, in charge of research, and he's my, actually my boss, my chairman at the North Carolina A&T State University. <laughs> <laughs> then we have uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Bala Kumar. He's uh, from Lincoln University, from Missouri, in Lincoln University. And uh, he will talk about the outreach today and uh, Dr. Hamush will talk about uh, research and education. And you can see this is a big uh, consortium with eight university and three uh, national laboratories or plants. And so the industrial partner, that's the three uh, national uh, laboratory or plants. And I don't know how DOE differentiate this, but uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory is a research laboratory. And uh, National Security Complex in the past we call Kansas City Plant. They manufacture uh, nuclear parts for the nuclear weapons. And Y-12 Security Campus uh, in the past we call Y-12 Plants, they, are, they actually supply all the nuclear materials for all the commercial, and uh, Department of Energy, power plants, and all other needs for the nuclear materials. And the target audience are uh, interested in the STEM students in all the different degree programs. We have some universities have PhD program, some universities only have master program, and some university they only have a bachelor program, and in all different area. But with the the uh, technology and all the thing get us together is will gear to the advanced manufacturing in uh, 3D printing. <clears throat> so, and we have three subcommittee as I mentioned before: we have research and development, and then we have education and we have an outreach. So because the education has to end outreach actually have depends on the R&D. So the output from R&D and uh, can feed to other uh, two subcommittees. And so the entire consortium and we can work together. And the pipelines, and uh, we believe that if the focus on the effort on our student, and from K th uh, through 20, and usually we say K through 12, but then we include the, um, the high schools and the college, and that becomes K through 20. And so we can apply what our education and outreach and so that we can produce the uh, pipeline workforce for, for this country. And we have a process, so we say, okay, now who will we classify as our student? Uh, essentially, that's a minority student. And so we have to identify, then we have to track the student, okay? 
Now, in each university, we have different programs. And uh, how do we say this student is belong to this project, this MSIPP? So then we can uh, track them and know when they come into our program and when they go out of the program and what type of employment in they get and is our training uh, successful or not. So who are the MSIPP students? And so we first, of course, if they are supported by our project, and so we, we classify them as our student. Also, the second bullet says, you know, who take two or more of the newly developed courses in advanced manufacturing, and then we say uh, they are uh, our uh, MSIPP student. So if they do research, and they also get edu educated uh, or take two courses, and then we can classify as our student. Then, of course, if they are extensively involved in our outreach program, sometimes we have to hire students to help with the outreach program. And each university, we already have outreach programs in most of our university, but if that program is specifically funded by this project and we hire the student and work in this program and we can classify they are uh, our students so that when the um, DOE and NSA ask now how many students you train, how many students involved, and essentially we can say once they are involved like this we can say you know they are our student. The last one is a student who participate in exchange program and or they uh, participate in the internship programs and then we classify as our student. And because we have eight university and we di different level of educational uh, degree, so sometime, and for example, we have a Clark Atlanta student come to North Carolina a and and to get their master degree and then we can say they're exchange student and we classify them as uh, MSIPP student. And of course, we have to develop metrics to say, okay, how many students you have? You start with the zero, we have benchmark, and after one year, how many students you, uh, you trained and educated, and then uh, for each university, we start with our total number of students in engineering or in the science program, or STEM, you know, other STEM area. And so, for example, Lincoln University, they have mathematics program. And most other university, we have engineering program. And, and engineering program, some of them only have undergraduate, and some of them have master program, and some of them have PhD. So we develop metrics for each university and to count the numbers. So we have to, because after, uh, we have to write a quarterly report, and uh, then each year we have to give annual report. The project started October last year, so the, we finished the three quarters. <clears throat> Any questions? This is the, the basic uh, idea for the management part. Now, Dr. Hamush is going to uh, discuss the research, development, and education. Any questions for me? Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Good afternoon. My name is Samir Hanmush, and I'm lucky to have two chairs title, chair of the department and chair of the R&D. But there is no money in this. <laughs> you can do that money. Yeah, there's no money. Well, to know how difficult to run uh, this type of consortium, I'm going to skip some of the slides. And the reason we have so many slides is because every university want to put their own. So we have so many, I'm going to go through some of them, which is I'm going to take it really fast and go through it. But the main one I want to talk about, what is, what is the objectives of our consortium in terms of the research? Why it is consortium to do research? And then I want to talk about the technical areas, then Technical team collaboration, I'm going to show only a and T team. And then I'm going to put two examples what we are doing this summer since we start the project. And finally, I'm going to present some of the metrics, and I'm going to go through that really fast. 
because it looks like the time is going to take us. Why we want to do consortium? Because we really want to pick up the brains from every university. There are so many areas. One university cannot really do it by themselves. So we have to go and seek collaboration with other university who has a subject matter expert into the area. Then, since there's no literatures in the field and there's no pu published papers, so we really want to push the idea of having peer uh, publications. We want to establish some conferences that we can attract other guys to come into the consortium and give us some of their research into the area. And finally, when you have so many universities and lab, we really have bigger um, infrastructures. So we can look into using the government laboratories to do some of their testing and testing equipment, some equipment available into one of the uh, parents and uh, maybe the sister institutions. So we can run on some of the experimental work there. Here are the, four, the six areas. They all, if you look at each area, in my judgment, it needs at least 10 years to really dig it all and get all what we needed in terms of research. For example, the modeling and simulation. What do we mean by modeling and simulation in the additive manufacturing? We are doing here 3D printing of metal alloys. I think Dr. Chang didn't mention that. We're looking at metals. We know we have powder and steel, and a lot of companies does steel. But the purpose of this is really not looking into having to produce 3D print out of steel, either product. So when we talk about modeling and simulation, we are talking about the modeling during the fabrication process. You have melted part. You want to add melted part on top of other melted segment to ensure that we have perfect bond, perfect integral part. There's no void or any difficulties in it. So we have to do modeling and simulation during the process of the fabrication. And then we have to do model and simulation after we produce the part. Especially if we create unintentional, maybe defect or small micro or nano level cracks, then we have to discover that and model for it. The second area is the product design. When we talk about the product design, it's, we, we know how to produce part if we do the typical way of doing uh, metal alloys. But since we are doing 3D printing, I need my part to be optimized. What does that mean, optimized? It means when you produce a part, there's some area in it you really don't need to be part of this part. It is only heavy weight is in there. So I want to take away the part that I don't need. In a way, that produced part will do the same way as the original part to make it the most effective, the lightest weight for us to use that part. It has many honeycombs, or we optimize that to make sure it works like the solid one, but it, it is much lighter and better designed. Now, during the process also, you do some, some surface defects and surface modification to improve some property somewhere based on what the uses of that part. Then we have to do some uh, physical testing. Physical testing, whether it's going to be destructive, it means you take it and test it, or you do non-destructive way. And there's a, there are a lot of non-destructive uh, evaluation methods but to go and evaluate a um, part that has either micro or at nano level defects, we really don't have any skills and technical capability in this country to come through that. So we are hoping to, by the end of this, to come up with some technique and strategy even to evaluate and assist that part without breaking it. We can look at it and say, well, this is really solid or not solid. And then the powder which is A and T charge in the powder design. Like I said, we know how to do steel powder. But the government, they really want to look into different type of powders. And they are really focusing on the uh, uranium. Even though it is not really active, it really acts like standard. 
But if we take the knowledge that we know about the, the stainless steel powder, can we do the same method for the uranium? And that's what we're going to look for. And finally, the material development is to have the mix of all the type of powder to come up with some mixed design that really suits the part that you want to produce. And these are the six areas that we are addressing. I'm gonna, just going to do here the, the powder production that is A&T in charge. So we have here every area we assign a university responsible person for that area. For the powder design, we have A&T the lead and we have other university and two laboratories involved in this. And the project we are doing right now is to do two things. One, how to produce a new powder, which is uranium. And then once you produce it, how you can evaluate that powder to make sure this powder really can do whatever you want to do. So we have to do chemo and physical testing for that powder to make sure it is going to produce the things we want to do. And then here, other areas, all universities associated with it. So I have to include all that in there. Here, I want to show you two projects that students are working on right now in the summertime. Now, you have a melted part coming here. Then you hit that part, the, metal, the melted one, hit it with a, a focal gas, will break it into smaller particles. And the breaked particles are going to fall down to here to be, collect, to be collected. What we need that it comes from state of being melted so hot, when I collect at the bottom, it has to be at 200 degrees. So even when we hit it with some gas, we want to make sure that we break it into particles that sizes we get there, suitable for what we need to produce the part from. So we have to do some modeling, and we have one student doing the modeling. We have two methods to do the model. One is the closed form solution, that simple one that we assign one undergraduate to do the modeling. When that part falls down, it's going to cool and it's going to collapse into the bottom. And then we have more sophisticated way of using some other uh, finite element method to do produce that part. But the, the equation we have to use either energy balance, heat balance, acceleration, all that wonderful things to come up with that solution for this powder production. Well, the second example I want to do is, well, let me just show you one, one uh, I don't know if we can open it here. I want to see if I can open that, OK. OK, here we have one student who doing the 3D printing of metals using the powder. The way we're doing it is layer by layer. We sp spread the powder. That machine comes on the top of it. Bond the part. See that so solid, the darker one? Those are the one we want to really keep. And then we wait until we come back and do the heating. We're drying it. So we're doing layer by layer. Here again. <coughs> okay, I want to stop it here due to the time constraint. Well, what the final thing we produce this part. In order for us to assist the quality of the powder, we really have to go through the closed loop. We have to produce, do the design, produce the part, test it, and then evaluate whether we did it or not. So you saw the guy, the, the, the person who's doing the, 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 the uh, specimen. We produce the specimen, we break it here, and we assess. 
we see if this is going to make us really improve whatever we are doing through that. And, and the idea here is to add nanoparticle to the steel powder to make it even stronger and better. So we included the nano part of it as a mean for us to improve the properties. Well, at the end, we have to go ahead and do the assessment like what Dr. Chang says. And this is assessment here only for the R&D area. For the R&D area, we have to look into after the first year and every quarter, we have to look into what we have accomplished under this area right now. So I want to stop here for the research if you have any question and then I can address. We have a colleague who's supposed to be with us doing the education, but he dodged at the end. So I'm going to take the liberty to go through the education part of it. To do the education, really there's no course material to cover whatever you saw there. And there's no method to convert these course material into technical and in community college. We have to understand first what is needed to understand this type of technology in order for us to transfer this into the community college and so on to the high schools. So we have to connect the educational part into the research and we have to connect that into the outreach activities. So what we, we need to do since we, we, we have industrial engineering accredited programs we have mechanical engineering. We know how to get those accredited. We know what area we can ad address to get the accreditation process. But for this type of technology, we really don't have either curriculums, we don't have courses, and we don't have a pipeline for us to bring students to this new area. So we have to go through curriculum building, we have to attract students, and then probably we have to develop some new classrooms. In order for us to develop a program, definitely we have to do, find out the, the, the class material that we need for to support each of the areas. So here we make some schedule. How, when do we have to produce some of the classrooms on the class course materials, and then when we can deliver that. So we have that scheduled in there. And then once we establish the course material and the area of specialties, then probably we have to think about the curriculum building. Curriculum building to support all the six research area that is needed for undergraduate and graduate students to get through that. Like Dr. Chang says, we have universities who has no masters and probably they don't have engineering. So we have to sign some articulation agreement with some of the smaller universities like Lincoln University, Clark Atlanta, and maybe Sanu, since they don't have engineering. So we have to establish some articulation agreement. And I think we have established some of the agreement between NCNT and, and uh, Clark Atlanta. And we have other spending trying to get that established under that uh, umbrella. Now, in order for us to develop the pipeline, we think there's a need for our students to spend time in the laboratories and spend time in the other institutions. So we proposed in our work, we're gonna place students either on short-term or long-term assignment, uh, either in summertime or during the academic year. So this is also part of our work that we are working on it. There's some area that we, we, we really don't have expertise in it, especially when it comes to production of uranium. So we are thinking to bring some of the laboratories expert to be a, an adjunct with our universities so they can assist us with the course material and teaching of these classes. Joint advising, again, for any undergraduate degree, we have advisor who are really familiar with the curriculum and then the way we can attract our students to, to proceed in a degree. But since here we don't have a degree, we have to have special attention to train our advisors how to advise students if they want to be in this type of area. And then we have also advising at the graduate level in case we have to establish some new, new R&D areas that requires us to produce masters and PhD level. So we have to get joint advising between the labs, the other university to have that established. Uh, we propose also to have a, a, a w faculty workshop. The faculty workshop, we're going to invite the best speakers and the best uh, researchers in the country to come and do uh, training for the professors in the consortium universities. We already 
established the first one going to be in March next year. We invited top, top researchers to come and integrate with our uh, effort to have that joint faculty workshop at the university. And here's some of the metric. And I'm going to stop here for the education part. Any question? Dr. Kumar is going to do the outreach. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I'm Balak Kumar from Lincoln University. I'm actually uh, substituting for one of the committee members. We need to get into the other slide, second Go back to the... Get out of here. Close it. And the, so this is the outreach uh, subcommittee membership. In Lincoln University, Mrs. Donna Starlings, she is una unable to be here, so I'm representing her. Uh, and to start with this outreach program, <coughs> as Dr. Chang pointed out, this uh, Consortium for Advanced Manufacturing has four components. One of them is the pipeline of STEM uh, students. Second one, education and training and uh, research and uh, development. And the fourth one is outreach. So starting from the camp out pipeline, so what are the responsibilities of the outreach committee? So they are responsible for these uh, K-12 summer programs. Uh, that happens uh, during summer and uh, teacher development, summer and during the year, and also year-round uh, programs are available. So I will get to that when we go along. So the outreach uh, committee is responsible for all these programs, administering and uh, monitoring all, all these programs in order to attract STEM students and matriculate them in uh, advanced manufacturing and later uh, uh, majors at a consortium institute. And Dr. Chang showed you who are the members of the uh, consortium. And then they go through undergraduate education and curriculum in advanced manufacturing. And during the process when they are uh, in the junior, senior years, and they will be undergoing uh, university-sponsored research and development in advanced manufacturing. Those are hands-on. And uh, when they get to the final year, they also will be collaborating with the uh, industry partners to do uh, internships, workshops, seminars, etc., in order to be uh, well-trained to meet the global workforce and also be ready for the graduate school. And the outreach, the main goal of the outreach uh, subcommittee would be to establish a sustainable HBCU MSI pipeline of STEM professionals. So students who are capable of handling this type of uh, uh, advanced manufacturing. And uh, the focus areas, we are going to focus on establishing collaborations between HBCUs and plants and labs, and expand STEM outreach opportunities focusing on advanced manufacturing. So those are the focus. And how they are uh, planning to achieve this is by creating programs, the program generally described before, uh, outreach programs, 
Those are summer programs and also year-round programs. And then in addition, there are summer exchange programs. And during these summer programs, students from different universities within the consortium, they, uh, they participate in other university programs, summer exchange. And uh, universities, in collaboration with the uh, industry partners, they hold uh, industry day. And, uh, and universities, they are preparing to have some high school, uh, high school expansion model in which they involve high school teachers and uh, students in order to come up with some STEM programs so that students can get the uh, taste of uh, advanced manufacturing and STEM uh, uh, areas. And then the Southeast Conference on uh, uh, Mechanical Engineering Summit, uh, Summer, Su Summer Institute. So participation in those institute will also uh, an outreach activity. And, and there is another one, Intercology 8 p.m. entering programs. And that's, uh, that hasn't started yet. And uh, for K-12 students, these are the uh, pro programs, outreach program, summer uh, industry day, and high school expansion model. For the K-12 educators, high school expansion model, SEGMI Summer Institute. For the undergraduate and graduate students, it will be outreach programs, summer program exchange, industry day, in the collegiate uh, PM entering programs. So those are the ones planned for. That's the committee membership. And then what are the pre-college initiatives? The main goal here is to increase, sustain, track, monitor STEM workforce. So how, how they are planning to do this, improving STEM educational experience, enhancing employability, and enriching with STEM experience. So those are the main objectives of this uh, consortium. And in doing so, they are assisting partners to improve STEM programs, plugging in gaps in STEM programs, and introduce STEM activities targeting future students from a young age. So that those are the uh, ways in which they are assisting. And then summer programs. The objectives are, The objectives are offering uh, offer learning opportunities in academic programs and learning opportunities in advanced manufacturing and offer HBCU experiences and summer experiences. So those are the objectives. And the summer program RFP is prepared by the outreach committee. And the proposal expectations, uh, AM teaching tools, advanced manufacturing teaching tools should be included, PI stipend, student stipend, program support, accommodations, and also include one of the uh, camp partners whenever they submit a proposal. So funds are available through the consortium, and uh, partners have to apply. Those are the HBCU universities. And the outreach committee reviews and selects the, uh, selects the right program. So, and then see what are the uh, outreach programs, uh, the partner uh, programs proposed by the partners. Harvard University, they are involved in a project designing a major enabler of manufacturing, exposing K-12 teachers and students to computer science, engineering, robotics, and animation. So that's their uh, involvement. Uh, the goal is to stimulate uh, STEM interest and establish partnership with at least four high school and community college, colleges in the process. The part currently, they are involved in a partnership with two Kansas City under, underrepresented high school students, uh, high schools, and uh, the mechanical engineering faculty and the graduate student are the project team. And the project plan would be uh, evaluate the design software NX and trial run at Harvard, demonstrate in a workshop to partners, and demonstrate concepts to middle and high school teachers and students in a one-day workshop. So that's uh, for their involvement. And Lincoln University, 
is involved in uh, actually three summer camps. One is investigating E for middle school students, and the other one is an engineering camp for uh, high school students. And the third one is uh, a camp for uh, incoming freshmen. 20 freshmen will be selected, and they will go through some uh, learning in uh, English, mathematics, and science subjects and uh, advanced manufacturing, the use of Creo uh, 3D software and AutoCAD software. Uh, and uh, it'll be uh, planned for the fall of 2015. And then uh, North Carolina <laughs> University is uh, having uh, is planning to host two, two camps, design studio pilot, and 20 middle school students in one of them and 20 high school students in the other one. And that's their project. And they are also involving students in the use of uh, Creo software and uh, uh, in, designing, uh, in designing objects, 3D objects and Southern University of New Orleans. And they are also having a summer program again. It, it involves the use of Creo uh, 3D software and AutoCAD and in uh, designing 3D objects and the use of 3D print, uh, printing. Undergraduate students supported, two undergraduate students, 35 participants, and a two-week program. And all these summer programs the university, they share their curriculum with other partners so that others will come to know what they, are, what they have been doing. And it's, uh, it's about the other one, the Industry Day. It's one of the outreach uh, activities and uh, where they collaborate with the industry partners and uh, invite them to their university. And uh, the other industry partners will be uh, having some workshop in order to let the students know what they have been doing, uh, development in new product, research, and all that. And uh, and UDC's Industry Day uh, hosted during the Engineering Day. The guest speaker was uh, Mr. Francisco from NSC. And it's ma mainly focusing on advanced manufacturing. and. Uh, Harvard's Industry Day hosted during their E-Week, and that is also mainly on uh, advanced manufacturing. And about the summer exchange uh, programs, as I mentioned before, and every university will invite students into their summer uh, programs, and uh, th these are the activities going on. Uh, NCAT, North Carolina State University, right, a and and uh, uh, SONO and UDCs and undergraduate students to Harvard University for student exchange program and Lincoln University sent two students to UDC and uh, Harvard. Like that, the partnership and the exchanges are going on uh, during this process. And, uh, and this is about the regional high school expansion model and uh, Hamptons Pipeline high, uh, high School Expansion Model involves uh, targeting a uh, high school called the Hunter B. Andrew, Andrew School. And here they are proposing uh, uh, involving a STEM teacher by the name Ms. Garcia, supported with a stipend to direct an after school program with AM Focus. So that is their high, high school expansion model. So that uh, high school student will be involved in the program. And then the UDC uh, high school expansion model will be uh, targeting area schools. Uh, high school teacher will be supported with the stipend to be trained in the use of 3D scanners uh, to produce ready to use 3D models for printing with 3D printers. Right? Uh, those are the two high school expansion models. And the SECME Summer Institute. So this is an institute that have been uh, uh, having meetings for the last 38 years involving uh, um, STEM uh, initiatives 
K-12 educators, university faculty and industry partners, they're all involved in these uh, meetings every year. So the outreach subcommittee uh, has funds to, to send some uh, five teachers and an outreach subcommittee member annually to these conferences. Uh, so and that uh, information about that is given there. And these are the metrics, how they are doing, what are the programs they have been involved in 